Mark, uh, my name is Cahill McGuire and I'm a theatre maker, writer, facilitator, dramaturg, uh, whatever you have in yourself. And I, I make work under the company name Game Theory, uh, when it's my own work, and I also work in collaboration with other artists and, and organisations. Cool. Uh, it, it, is it useful to list off any credits or anything? Or? Oh, yeah, I'll I, I give you an opportunity later on. Um, Perfect. I'm just interested in in um, beginnings. Like, I'm always fascinated. Was this something you've always wanted to do? Was it in your family? Was it kind of something you fell into? Or how did that all happen? Uh, it's not in the family in any great way. Um, I can, no, one, no one works in the industry or has worked in, in any big professional way in the industry. Uh, it's kind of something I fell into. It's sort of, in a weird way, it's kind of the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> or at least it's the one thing that I've, I've been able to kind of carve out some kind of uh, uh, professional uh, space for myself. Um, but yeah, I just sort of fell into it. I, I was not that good at school from about the age of 12. And then I I kind of, got into college and found out, oh, this is just more school. Uh, I'm, I'm not really into this. But at the same time, I did a, uh, a an internship with the Dublin Fringe Festival, which turned into a staff role uh, on, the, on that festival that year. And that was a big moment for me because it was this uh this glimpse of this crazy world where people were doing the stuff that i was into but were doing it in this incredibly diverse and entertaining and mad and brilliant and beautiful way or ways i should say that's really the important part was how many different versions of this thing were possible in a way that i just didn't know and so that was that was yeah that was me done i i ran away with the circus then really and i've been i've been doing i've been doing theatre in various ways ever since and so like when you were younger um were you actively kind of you know were you a big writer were you be actively or a big writer or re reader or like you know consumer of the arts yeah i think there's there's a couple of things that really benefited me one was that my my parents were I had a big love of the arts, uh, so my uh, both my parents love uh, the arts in general. My father's a, an amateur jazz musician, and so we have been brought to things like like the concerts for kids and the national concert hall. Like a lot of this, I did benefit from actually being from Dublin and living in Dublin. So there's a lot more stuff. I I, uh, I did an exercise in a workshop recently where I was where we were all thinking back to our earliest theatrical memories, like what was the first thing that you saw? And it's a kind of a marker to how, um, <laughs> to, to how uh, quickly my family has become middle class after not being for generations, that uh, the first thing I remember seeing was the Australian um, contemporary circus group, Circus Oz in the Olympia. But that is genuinely the first thing I remember seeing, and it was class. Circus in the, in the Olympia, wow. Yeah, yeah, it was this beautiful theatrical circus. I have this vivid memory of a performer scampering along the balcony, like on the very edge of the balcony. And it was a beautiful moment where someone walked across this artificial ceiling that they built on the, on the massive Olympia stage, uh, on sitting down, upside down, at a table and pouring orange juice upside down into a glass. I have no idea how they did it, but you know, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Like if you show that to a six-year-old, of course you're going to end up in the arts. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and was it then? I mean, once that book hit, did you did you go to a lot? Did you have access to a lot of theatre when you were young? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was again. Luckily, I w had access to like after-school drama classes and uh, kind uh, kind of sort of youth theatre stuff. And that was where, yeah, that was where I made my close friends when I was a teenager was through, was through being in plays with them and writing plays and directing plays with them. And did that exist with, with, within school at all, Carl? Was there, was there any uh, opportunity within school? Uh, when I was in primary school, it, it was kind of an adjunct. It was, the classes happened in the school building, but they weren't, they weren't, from the faculty itself. I'm not sure exactly what the arrangement was. And then when I was a teenager, it was it was after school. I mean, there was some stuff in school, but not not really. And I, I had very little, like 
I gave school the bare minimum amount of engagement, if if that. Uh, and the trajectory then, sorry, from there to to the fringe, kind of in, how did that? How did your path kind of lead from like leaving school to? It was entirely coincidental in that way of just someone knew someone. Uh, the an, a friend of the family uh, who is who was a. Um, like a massage therapist and sports, sports, sports guy. He was a sports guy, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> he was a giant Australian sports guy. Uh, he worked with various sports teams doing uh, physiotherapy. And uh, a friend of his from back home in, 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 in Oz was coming over to be the artistic director of the Dublin Fringe Festival. Okay. And because he knew that I did arty stuff, he said, give him a call. I did. I got an interview. I got the internship. I didn't, I didn't mess that up, so they put me on staff, and that meant that I, had, I knew the context, which meant that the next year I was able to pitch a show, and that got programmed, and that was, that was, a, um, that was a decent show. I mean, it was stressful as well I had to make. Hmm? What was the show? It was it was a play what I wrote uh, called the the King Sweeney, which was a uh, it, it turns out it was, you know the way you, like, you make something and then years later you go oh that's what that was about so I had I had that like ten years later I was like, oh, it was a dream it was <laughs> but it was it was that uh, that odd it, the whole tone of it was that odd kind of like Lynchian thing of like something slightly uncanny about this. A sort of Tom Murphy-ish, Harold Pinter-ish, uh, coming to get back together of a family of a group of brothers and the outside, the outsider, one of their girlfriends, and how uh, that kind of all the all the stories and in jokes and trauma of the family life come back up, and people become other people in the way that they do in dreams. That you you know that that person is this person, even though they don't look like them or sound like them. Yeah, yeah. It had all that kind of stuff going on. I mean, it was quite a, it was a hard thing to do. It was, because I didn't know how to write a play, apart from you just write the play. I didn't have any craft as such. I hadn't studied it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was directing my friends, which is fucking terrible because like, they'll just tell me to, I'm not doing that. There was no professionalism at all. It was just a gang of kids trying to put on a show. Uh, so I still don't know if it was, any good? Uh, the the Irish Times shot on it from a great height, which uh, <laughs> I always appreciated that. Uh, then for that, and but the but people who I respect came to saw it, and they said like there there's definitely something to it that there's a voice there that there's a theatrical awareness there. Uh, the the late lamented Irish uh, the Irish Theatre magazine. Yeah, came to some, saw some some good in it, so it was one of those things. Like there, I knew I was onto something. I knew I could put on a show. I could create a show that I had uh, thoughts and instincts and opinions and taste about how theatre might happen. I just didn't have any. Uh, I just didn't have chops yet. It's kind of like that Ira Glass thing where he talks about there's this painful gap between you having taste and aspiration and having skill. And at that, that moment, that's where you do all the crap stuff. And it's really painful because you can see the big gap between what your taste and instincts are bringing you and your imagination to what your skill can actually execute. And Camille, in relation to, to that then, because um, that's really interesting. So how, how, how did you know internally, you kind of like, oh, like, what is that the way that felt? Did you kind of trust that, that there was something there for yourself? Uh, oh, that's... I mean, the short answer is yes, I did trust that there was something there. How I trusted that, uh, I, it's hard to kind of cast my mind back to that mindset uh, from where I am now. I'm sure a lot of it was driven by insecurity and ego and sheer bloody mindedness. Uh, and, and I definitely had a lot of strong opinions uh, about what what theatre could be and a lot of it was influenced by what I was reading and, and, and that kind of thing and that very you know uh, and the, the playwrights that I, I was I was influenced by at that stage so it was quite a tight little box yeah, yeah. 
and it was it was very much a young man's like yeah this is this is what I this is what I want to do and it's coming from the quite unformed place um, but I think if I have one core skill and it does go back to that thing of having absorbed a lot of stuff everything from being like brought to uh, mad Australian circus uh, and pantos and uh, yeah, Beckett plays in, in, in the gate from when I was really young to reading um, just a lot of stuff uh, in I was I had the, the great good fortune to be educated in two different languages which give me a different perspective and access to different culture and but having a quite just just a broad intake of culture uh, and especially stories I think that's possibly the big it's probably not as big a gap now but that when I was a kid that was the the big gap between cool and uncool between being you know uh, hip and being dorky was that hip was music yeah and all the dorky stuff was stories yeah. and as much as I love music and play music and still like music drives a lot of what I do this core part of me is around stories and if I have one core skill that I've derived from all of this is a slightly freakish ability to not just tell stories but to intuit how a story might be told okay. so given given a story having a sense of how to shape it in in the real time exchange that theatre requires when an audience can take it in okay go back what's the, what was the second language Carl what's what, talk about that uh, so my my parents uh, lived in Montreal in the 70s for a couple of years while well, my dad was doing his uh, master's thesis and as such they were required to learn French in order to get like work permits and stuff like that and they would have seen the benefit of having a second widely spoken language on the basis of that yeah. and so when myself and my brother when they were looking for for schools for us through this odd connection of a, a uh, of a weekend football team that my father played for, uh, Pegasus United, I think. Uh, they were playing a team of French waiters, and one of them introduced my parents to this new incoming principal of a school, uh, which was the uh, the Franco Irish School. Now it turns out that the French government with a lot of these schools in different countries where because the education system there is so streamlined that when, you know, uh, a family moves to another country because Papa works for Air France or Citroën or something like that, that little, uh, you know, little Eloise and Benoit can, you know, do two years of school and are learning about the life cycle of mushrooms at, exact, at the exact same week that all their contemporaries are back in France. Uh, but it, it was this tiny mad school where... Uh, where there was Irish kids and French kids, and like in in like the in this era when Ireland was not multicultural, I had the the good fortune to have like childhood friends from Korea and Egypt and Belgium and places like that. So I had this kind of idyllic mm. uh, early schooling in, in where I was uh, like my parents still tell stories about me being frustrated that I don't know the English word for something which was slightly cringy but it, listen it's how I it's how I grew up and then uh, the sudden sharp left turn into uh, a more Irish education system which didn't really didn't really suit me but that's a long roundabout way of saying I, I speak a bit of French. <laughs> um, so how did you then after doing the fringe first time and going oh, okay I can, how did how did, how did you set about it then you know looking at after the craft bit what was kind of in your head like how did the next bit progress for you well the next bit was i made another show uh, kind of and i learned the hard way that this is a, not a good reason to do a show i did a show because i felt like i should i felt like i should make a show in the next fringe and uh, the 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 mates who i made the king sweeney with were kind of like yeah you know what? i'm gonna leave this one which to be honest Fair enough, uh, with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, and so we ended up programmed in the festival with this show that was just a rough idea about like doing stuff uh, around, based on the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. 
And I'll tell you, there's probably an Edgar Allan Poe show in every fringe festival across the world. I got, every year, there's at least one somewhere <laughs> in some fringe festival, whether it's Edinburgh or Adelaide or wherever. Someone is attempting to do this because it sounds like a good idea. And it's like, it, it's, it's the same way that every year someone attempts an, an adaptation of, um, of The Little Prince. Cause it sounds like a good idea and it never, ever is because there are some things that just work better on the page. They seem like they should work in the stage and they just don't. Maybe Stephen Burkoff pulled it off. I don't know. I didn't see that show. But uh, yeah, we tried that and um, it, it, was, it, was, it was not good. It was because um, it was made under duress. It was made for no money because we had an obligation to produce a show. Uh, and and I, I was a bit burned after that, I'll tell you the truth. And so I, uh, I went back to, uh, to performing and to uh, doing shows with friends of mine and just trying to get back some of the love of it. Now it turns out, some, someone, I can't remember who said this. I wish I could. Someone said, if you have, if you think of a shot of living a happy life without being an actor, don't be an actor. And that is very, very solid advice. And uh, because I'm just not that good. I'm not that good. I'm not that good an actor. I'm okay. I'm pretty good. I'm not that good. And I didn't have the love for it. I, there's... I, I love actors and I work with them when I'm allowed to work. I work with them and they're great. And one of the things I love about actors is they're able to find the craft of it in any old shite. There's some actors who are able to go, this is terrible, but I get to do this thing that I love and I'm going to focus on this one thing that I get to do where there's this one line, or it's just, where there's just the, the discipline of being in a terrible show and still being a professional. I didn't have that. I didn't have that deep, like the craft wasn't like deep within me uh, as a performer. Uh, but I was able to, being in these shows, both good and bad, uh, I was able to kind of identify the decisions that were being made by the director and by the by the creative team and go that's interesting that's interesting how that's working and that's interesting how it's not working and i tell you you learn a lot about directing by being directed badly <laughs> uh, so having been directed badly and going well i could do better than that that kind of put a little bit of of uh yeah that, that put some some meat on my legs as the swedes say and uh, but then the big breakthrough was I studied facilitation. I studied as a youth theatre facilitator with the the now sadly very tragically defunct arts train uh, training system that uh, that Dave Kelly and John Tate and Alan King all of uh, all now who were all working with what was then uh, the National Association for Youth Drama and now Youth Theatre Ireland they put together and that was brilliant because that was not only was I in the real <laughs> workshop based youth theatre that I never knew I missed out on and was actually discovered that I that was how I learned I learned in a very participatory non-hierarchical informal way so suddenly I was kind of on this high of like oh this is this is what I needed this is this is the thing that was missing uh, and we just got to you know play games and then think about playing games and then play the games better, which is that's that's why I called my my company of one plus whoever that's why I called it game theory because that's what that's what I love is playing and then thinking about playing so you can play better or differently, and that was also a beautiful mix of people because it was both theatre professionals who were like me kind of on on the on the bubble people like like Dan Colley and Sean Dunn, who are, who are still working now, and, and actors like Sean Curvin and Leanne O'Cleary and, uh, the, and, and uh, Dee Burke as well. And it was also uh, people who weren't uh, theatre makers, who were youth workers. And that beautiful combination um, really just uh, it gave me a year of of freedom to play around, uh, to be on the dole and be paid to go to this training that I, w I would have paid myself to be a part of. Uh, and it gave me technique. It gave me skills. 
gave me an approach. But the most vital thing is that it gave me the thing that college really gives you, which is time spent with other people who love the same thing you love. And that was the thing that I didn't have. That yeah. was the thing that I missed out on when I didn't go to college was being with contemporaries and get it, and becoming such good friends with, with, with Dan Colley and, and Dee Burke, who were like, Dan was um, about, he was maybe a, two years away from starting working with Collapsing Horse. Uh, Dee was working as an actor with Anu, uh, myself and Dee and Dan, we collaborated on Dee's Show in a Bag show two years after that. And it just gave me uh, this new network, this new set of relationships, this new, a new start, really. Yeah, it's fascinating that, um, that you know, it's oft talked about in industry circles, but the influence of well, youth theatre and arts training um, across the industry is, you know, huge. And I think what you're right there about that kind of mixture of, people who are doing it as a career or want to do it as a career, people who are not sure what the hell they're doing and people who are in a different career. It's a huge, yeah. it kind of really, it's a great ground, grounding thing and having worked for many years myself, you know, in youth theatre, um, that's where we met, facilitating yeah. national youth theatre. I just think there's something really special, as I said, as I say, as an adult who, you know, that has some experience that kind of college of drama soccer, whatever, whatever it is, that kind of, collegiate feeling it's yeah it's a great place and you know the work the the work that the beauty theater ireland did with our arts training has been phenomenal can i bring it forward then please from that experience and from that new grounding let's say that, that, that you had where did the you know what was important to you with the company then like what was the thing what, what was it like okay this is what i want to do i uh I I wanted to make the work that I wanted to see and that I hadn't seen yet. Okay, it's really yeah. <laughs> what it came down to. And, and practically, and, yeah, like practically, how how like was it interesting to have practically? How did you go about then, kind of making that happen for yourself? Mm. So, uh, myself and and Dan Colley and Dee Burke, uh, we got on really well in in that because you know you're in that environment and you're saying, oh, I I like the way she thinks, I like the way he thinks, we vibe off each other. I had this instinct that we could work well together. And so we we met, it would have been maybe a, probably less than a year after we graduated uh, in what was the then the empty former gaiety school space, which would become fringe yeah. space. And uh, just to talk about ideas, and I had a few in my back pocket, but the one that really seemed urgent was uh, a show about the internet. And I knew, at that stage, I knew three things about it, with that, with that it was, first of all, a show about the internet in a very, but even then my instinct was that it was kind of documentary show about the internet, a non-fiction show about the internet, that, we would never show the internet. It wasn't the case of like, and here is Wikipedia, uh, which led to, and the adjunct to that was no visible technology. So no microphones, no monitors, no screens, no projections. And, and that it would be called always alone together. Because that's to me what the internet, the experience of the internet is. And uh, so we had this line and then we started we got some fringe lab space uh, on the on the back of the uh, having all worked together on on D's show in a bag. We had that relationship with Fringe again, uh, and so we got a development space where we just just sat around a table and read read stuff, read to each other. I'd come in, I'd uh, rake a lot of stuff that I'd printed off uh, because I didn't know how the internet worked. That was why I wanted to make the show. Uh, I wanted to make the show because there was this, this thing that had happened essentially in my lifetime that had completely changed the world and I did not understand it and I wanted to understand it. And my instinct says, if I can if I can make a show that makes other people understand it, then I will have had to understand it in order to do that. So that was the, that was the impetus. And it went through various layers of 
non-funded development over about four years off and on and uh, there was a version that we made that had five actors in it which was that was a classic case of like strong but wrong it's like i see what you did there didn't work and uh then at roughly the same time as i was doing arts train i was doing this there was this other little micro community that i'm very grateful for which was a classic thing of stuff that happens during a recession this uh this art space that no longer no longer exists um uh popped up on east Essex street and i've the exchange exchange is what it was called and uh a lot of young um artists and creative people and cultural workers uh, all crossed over in this space and there was this beautiful open mic storytelling night called uh, Milk and Cookies Stories, which went for several years, uh, which I told the first open mic story at the, the first event of Terrible Grammar, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And so I did this, I, I started doing this thing, which was uh, inspired by uh, an idea from um, a, a, one of my pals from that scene, one of the co-founders, a guy called Shauna Hegertig, which is non-fiction storytelling where I would go and I'd research a thing, something that intrigued me, whether it was uh, the like theatre superstitions or the origin of the song My Way or how LSD went from a pharmaceutical to the drug of the counterculture. And I would just tell that story. And then we realised that that was probably the right format for Always Alone Together is just me with armed with these brilliant stories that we'd found and just telling them and that that became that became the show how did that for you then who was kind of you know back on stage again with that and yeah. how, how was that for you was that kind of daunting uh <laughs> yeah it was um i did my my go-to line about it is is actually um stealing a line from uh from Truman Capote, who famously said of the book On the Road, that's not writing, that's typing. So when I asked about doing Always Alone Together, it's like, it's not acting, it's talking. It's story. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't playing someone else, I was me, in my own clothes, on stage, telling the stories. A little bit of acting sometimes, small bit. How has the company developed since that, since that call? What kind of... You know, what, what did that kind of show give to you in relation to what, what you want, wanted to do and what you, you see, what you still want to do? Well, it gave me a bit of street cred, uh, as in people in the industry came to see it uh, and, and, uh, and seemed to really like it. It's one of those shows that I, hardly anyone saw, but a lot, almost everyone seemed to like, which is, uh, it's now really frustrating that that was the, the year that the Irish Times stopped reviewing everything as a matter of course so we got one crit which was not really useful because it was one of those classic examples of uh, the critic reviewing the show that they wanted the show to be or thought they should the show should be yeah. and uh and also i it was essentially just me i had this team uh that we brought together to make the show but it was it was always just me on stage and then afterwards it was kind of I was left with this yeah. show, but without the infrastructure of, you know, a a producer or or even just other collaborators to to kind of give me that little hoosh to 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 bring it further. And then without without it having been reviewed, which is like I have like a lot of artists, I have very ambivalent feelings about reviews in general and the critical discourse in this country in particular. But Jesus, it's helpful. Like the we did a show in Fringe this year, this year just gone, a uh, game theory show, and that got that got a good crit. It just it was just the one, but my God, was that helpful? Yeah, and it it gives it it gives it a a little bit more. When then when you when applying for stuff, I was uh, well first well that is a big thing of what having done done the show did for me was like, well, I've done a show recently. I have made a thing. And it was, it was, uh, it, it strengthened some applications. It meant that I could, uh, 
when I was working on the, the follow-up, because that's what we learned making the show, was that it probably needs to be several shows. This, what, our ambitions for this show could not be contained by <laughs> the walls of this single project, that it needed to be more. And that is a thing that I'm still working on, is the rest of this project, however, however it manifests itself. Or is there, I won't keep much longer, I've got a couple of questions I want to kind of finish off with. Is there, mm. is there pieces of work, not necessarily theatre, but it's like you're talking about the Australian circus, but is there, you mentioned music, are there pieces of work that kind of inspire you or that, have cha- you know, that you go back to that changed you or like are things you remember that have really mm. marked passages for you? Yes, uh, yes, definitely. One so one of the big ones was um, National Theatre of Scotland's Black Watch, which really opened my eyes to what what like nonfiction and documentary theatre can do. That's a gorgeous show, uh, and it really gave me a sense of like that. That I call it the shock of the real. That sense of like when the beautiful kind of metaphorical world of theatre meets something like true, like really true from the actual real world. Uh, that's a beautiful feeling. Uh, the uh, elevator repair services version of The Great Gatsby, uh, Gats, is just gorgeous. Um, I'm so glad I got to see that. So many shows, the like big international shows, when when DTF used to have the the budget to be able to bring them over, like seeing like Romeo Castellucci stuff and uh, Anne Bogart stuff, things like that, really shaped um, how I think about the work uh, in terms of Irish stuff, um, Pan Pan's work, I'm thinking things like uh, that kind of late 2000s stuff like Macbeth 7 and 1 and those really ambitious shows, Uh, 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 Oedipus Loves You, the the Chinese uh, language version of Playboy, that was really, that really kind of, yeah, that got under my skin in a really um, positive way. I could, I could I could go on and on about stuff. And Colin, finally, I suppose you know, I mean these are these initial access chats have been recorded in a time where we're all kind of to think back on your show where we're all um, you know confined and on the internet quite a lot. Yeah. Just in, in interested in relation to how you as as an artist or you as a theatre maker, you know engage with the public and kind of the importance of that and you know if we're missing a trick or is there something else that you know to make people realize what it is you do with the 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 beautiful thing is with theater is that it you need the audience and you need them there to complete the circuit in a way that is not if not unique very particular to the form and like I've been uh, really lucky to have my mind very recently blown open by the possibilities of making work for children. And I made this show, that was the show that I mentioned, uh, Moop, which we made for for the Young Radicals part of Fringe last year. And that is, like, if you want to have the a real sense of the immense... Uh, privilege and responsibility uh, uh, of entertaining then making work for young audiences really uh, puts put some hospital corners on that that idea but I truly believe that uh, that entertainment is vital and I think that what we do I think uh, we can get really deep into the like the intellectual and aesthetic weeds of of theater and we're in real danger of getting cloistered off in ivory towers and forgetting that to quote my my friend Diane Crotty uh, that we are essentially descended from like showgirls and bear baiters like we are we are show folk and uh, that that I think the primacy of that and the vitality of that and the essence of that is our relationship with our audience and the and the the exchange of 
and the, the exchange of that, the contract of that, but also the, the, the beauty of when it really cooks and when everyone is doing that thing. Like the, I, I, I have to check that this isn't just bollocksy pseudoscience, but whether we are actually all, our heart rates and our breathing rates are synchronized. But like anyone who's on stage will tell you the moment when you really feel that the whole room is with you. It is, it is magic. And I think that uh, if we can if we can foreground the value of that as, as an industry, as artists, I think we can do a lot to, to reconnect with our, our audience and our potential audience, which is so much bigger than our actual audience. Uh, I'm, I'm saddened by that, but I remain optimistic that we can, we can reach out, we can find them. Cool, Carl, thanks very, very much for taking part. I'm gonna leave, leave it at that and you. let you go back to your cave. <laughs> um, I hope to see you again very, very soon when we're all released. Brilliant, Mark. I look forward to it. Thank you.